Good evening, people of the Winter Lecture Series. We are pleased to be able to bring the second in this series of um, programs to you tonight. We're um, thankful for the support that we receive from Humanities Nebraska. They provide the grant that uh, provides the funding for these programs. We also would like to thank Ollie for the uh, heroic job that they do for us in helping us to publicize these. A lot of people missed last Sunday because we unfortunately conflicted with a program presented by the um, Lincoln Symphony Orchestra. And so uh, to uh, bring people up to speed for what they may have missed last week, uh, David Forsyth is going to give us a little bit of a review. And after that, uh, Peter Levitov introduced the speaker. Uh, David, uh, take it away. Uh, thanks, Dick. I'm going to race through this because it's eventually going to be on the church website, at least as part of this recorded session tonight. So uh, people will have a chance to go into a little further detail if they want. So I'm going to go through this very, very quickly to save time for our speaker. Uh, Tom Weiss last week noted that if you go back to the middle of the 17th century, you find the Catholic Spanish fighting the Protestant uh, Dutch and others in the Low Countries. And it seemed like a good idea to get out of that problem to say that the local prince could determine the religion of that area. And that start in the middle of the 17th century morphed into the idea of state sovereignty, meaning that a national government speaking for a national state had the right to determine the policy in that area. Middle of the 17th century, state sovereignty, and it was sort of understood as a way to get outsiders out of the picture, out of the local picture. Uh, if you think about it, particularly if you think about uh, the Nazi era, um, leaving the German government to do what it wants to German Jews is not necessarily a good idea, uh, but that is part of the evolution of state sovereignty that a national government has responsibility for what happens in national territory. Let's fast forward to the 1990s because uh, that's really crucial for some diplomacy and diplomatic language uh, that came out of the United Nations. You have Somalia, mass starvation, uh, interventions don't go well. Shortly thereafter, you have Rwanda and the genocide and because of Somalia, outsiders really don't wanna get involved and the genocide continues. And then Kelly, in the next slide, we'll show that in addition to Somalia and Rwanda, you have a terrible thing centered on Bosnia. And then later in that same decade, we find that NATO is bombing Serbia to deter them from doing terrible things to uh, people in Kosovo. So the 1990s after the end of the Cold War, very chaotic, lots of bad things happening, Sometimes there's intervention, sometimes there's not intervention. And this whole thing, as Kelly will show in the next slide, <clears throat> causes the Canadian government to create a commission to think about all of this, the Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. Uh, it's, it's a state initiative from Ottawa, uh, but it's really a panel composed of, of private thinkers and they want to talk about the responsibility to protect, R2P. Well, what does that mean? Well, the next slide uh, will give a brief uh, summary. And here's the key point. This commission is trying to get us to think about state sovereignty in a different way. It's not so much a shield against outsiders as it is an obligation of all states to prevent or stop atrocities. It's not about all human rights. It's about genocide, ethnic cleansing, major war crimes, 
and there are other specifics in there, but it's a new way of thinking about state sovereignty. Next slide, please. It's an effort to link state sovereignty to human security, to say that yes, states are sovereign, but that means they have the responsibility to protect the security of individuals in their jurisdiction, in their territory. So it's a new way of thinking about state sovereignty and it meshes state sovereignty with human security. Final slide, please. Uh, this is, um, uh, this new way of thinking uh, is seen with some trepidation by a number of states, particularly weaker states, post-colonial states. And uh, there's a lot of hesitation about all this, uh, whether we're talking about Syria and Yemen or Darfur and Ethiopia or Myanmar and China. Uh, actually, it relates to Ukraine in a way. Uh, maybe the final, very final slide uh, can be put up now. And yes, uh, claims to humanitarian intervention, think Hitler, think Putin, and his claims that there's genocide against ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Uh, there's the problem of misuse, and that's why things should maybe go back to the Security Council. But the council is often divided, as we know, and unable to reach agreement whether on Ukraine or on other subjects. But anyway, there is a nickel's worth of review of what Tom Weiss talked about, a new way of thinking about state sovereignty, trying to link it to human security. And with that, I thank you for your time and um, back to Peter. Thanks, Dan. That was a great summary for, uh, for uh, folks who didn't happen to who be able to listen in uh, last week. It's my uh, honor and privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Joshua Landis. Uh, when Joshua Landis was a year old, his family moved from New York to Saudi Arabia. They lived there for three years and then moved to Beirut, Lebanon. So when he was 10 years old, they flew back to the United States, but that decade shaped his career, as you will see and hear with the rest of this introduction and with his presentation. Uh, Professor Landis earned a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College, majoring in European history and French literature. He spent his junior year, uh, sophomore year abroad in France. Uh, after he graduated from Swarthmore, he went back to Beirut in the middle of the Lebanese Civil War, and he taught at the International College in Beirut. The International College is the prep school of AUB, the American University in, in Beirut. Uh, in 1981, he went to Damascus University in Syria uh, on a Fulbright grant, then went back to graduate school, earned his MA from Harvard and a PhD from Princeton. Uh, Professor Landis uh, taught at Sarah Lawrence College at Wake Forest University and at Princeton before moving to the University of Oklahoma. There, uh, he teaches, conducts research and writes on political Islam international relations in the Middle East, the modern Middle East, culture and society in the Middle East, and the US in the Middle East. Since May 2004, Landis has published the monthly Syrian comment blog, which focuses on Syrian politics, history, and religion. It has a subscriber base, listen to this, of over 100,000 readers. Yes, 100,000 plus readers follow his blog on Syria. So you know we're getting one of the leading experts in the world on Syria today. Uh, Landis is professor of Middle Eastern history at the University of Oklahoma in Norman, where he holds the Sandra Mackey chair in Middle East studies. Uh, at OU, he's also the director of the Faranza Family Center for Iranian and Persian Gulf Studies, as well as being the director of the Center of Middle East Studies. Fluent in Arabic, and French as well as English. He's an internationally recognized scholar on political Islam and the international relations of the Middle East. He's widely published in respected journals like Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, and Middle East Policy, and has written numerous chapters in scholarly books. Landis is often called upon to speak at places like the Brookings Institute, 
the Council on Foreign Relations and the U.S. Institute of Peace. He's also a frequent commentator uh, on international media, such as PBS, Al Jazeera, NPR, and the BBC. Uh, awarded three Fulbright grants, his research has also been supported by the Social Science Research Council and other agencies. Uh, Josh Volantis has lived in the Middle East for 14 years, and until the Syrian civil war, he spent summers in Damascus for several decades. Tonight, he'll share his experience on both Syria and Yemen in the context of R2P, the responsibility to protect. I'm pleased to turn the mic and the screen over to Professor Joshua Landis. Well, thank you so much for that very uh, generous introduction. And I, I'd like to thank the church. I'd like to thank Nebraska, University of Nebraska, and, um, and Bed Ross, and all of you for um, listening in and for inviting me to speak here tonight at this, this um, important occasion. Let me begin. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm going to start off by saying I'm a bit skeptical about R2P, and I'm going to explain to you why. And it's that if we look at the violence that has, uh, let me just, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compare the violence that we're seeing in Yemen and Syria and the modern Middle East today to violence that we've seen in Europe after World War II, right after, at the, at the very end of World War II and up to 1950 in the shaping of new nation states. And I'm going to compare what I call the class of 1919. These are the new nation states that were created after World War I at the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, the class of 1919. And we will see that what happens is that these new nation states that are created out of multi-ethnic, multi-religious empires go through a period of sorting out. I call it the sort of great sorting out because nation states are really like to have one ethnicity in them and to be homogeneous. This sort of creation of modern identities in a, in a nation state is a long and bloody process. And we see that very distinctly in the nation states that are created from Poland right down to Palestine. It tends to be a zero sum game for minorities that get often ethnically cleansed or mar very severely marginalized. It's long and bloody. The national borders are usually not changed to fit the people. The people are changed to fit the national borders. Now, I'm gonna look at identity here and I'm gonna compare what happens in Europe with the formation of nation states to what's gonna happen in the Middle East and particularly in the Levant and then in Yemen to show you that, to hopefully argue with you, to argue to you that it's very similar. And this is about the building of modern nation states. It's not about Islam and, um, and it comes out of these, particularly we're gonna focus on the states that are created out of these multi-ethnic empires where many different peoples live cheek by jowl. And then once you get a nation state, it's very difficult to create a common homogeneous political community that agrees on a constitution and on a set of rules for who's gonna govern and how to select those. So those are some of the basic I think uh, principles that we find in this, in this great sorting out that's gonna go on both in Europe and in the modern Middle East. And I'm gonna try to explain that the violence we're seeing is very, uh, is attached to this state formation, this modern nation states. Now here is a quick little map of the new nation states that are created out in the world, in World War I, in many respects, World War I is an empire destroying war. And out of those empires are created these new nation states, which are much more capable 
and better at war and at, at, at organizing people. So out of the German empire, Russian empire, Austro-Hungarian empire, and for our purposes, the Ottoman empire are created a lot of new states. And we can see there's nine new nation states created in central Europe uh, out of these three major empires that are destroyed in World War I, Russian, German, and Austro-Hungarian. In many ways, the Russian empire recreates itself under communism, just wears red clothing, um, and it doesn't go away. But we are going to get out of, out of uh, and I want to focus on a period of time 1944 to 48, after World War II, when World War II is coming to an end, but it continues, we think of it in the West as coming to an end in 45, but it doesn't really come to an end. It continues on, uh, and 31 million people are ethnically cleansed in Central Europe um, during this period. And if we just look for one example of Poland, um, 64% of Poles, uh, of the citizens of Poland in 1937 were Polish. The others were minorities. But by 1949, at the end of this period of the great sorting out for Poland, 100% of the people in Poland were Polish. And that other 36% are destroyed or ethnically cleansed. And as we know, 3 million Jews in Poland were destroyed. By the end of the war, when the Nazis were defeated, 7 million Germans were expelled, either from Poland or from East Prussia. If you look just above Poland, there in Königsberg and so forth, East Prussia, all of those Germans were ethnically cleansed. Ukrainians, the yellow part there you see on the right of your screen, and Belarus were also driven out of Poland and fled into nearby Ukraine and Belarus and so forth. So Poland became 100% Polish and the minorities were wiped out. If we look at the Czech, uh, as Czechoslovakia, 32% of the people inside Czechoslovakia that's created out of Austro-Hungary when it's destroyed in World War I are minorities. Uh, we think most you know, specifically of the Germans in Sudetenland, who were all ethnically cleansed at the end of World War I, uh, World War II, excuse me, and also the Jews, which are destroyed, but other minorities were also cleaned out of this area. And this gives us a sense of this real failure of the nation state to incorporate its minorities into a happy convivienda. Um, I put up a little map of Ukraine because I think that the violence in Ukraine is connected. And obviously it has a lot to do with, with foreign powers invading like Germany in World War II, but here in Russia invading Ukraine. But it, it, it is also following the lines of these ethnic groups that are vying for control of the nation state and are anxious lest they be ethnically cleansed. Let me just, you know, to finish up with Europe, let me just spend a second looking at the Germans, because 12 million Germans were ethnically cleansed from Central Europe between 1945 and 1947. Hitler, when he tried to conquer all this Central European area, thought that he was going to create Lebensraum and he was going to capture all these ethnic Germans, which you see on your map in front of you as little yellow dots. And ethnic Germans lived right across the expanse of Central Europe, Eastern Europe. And he thought he could capture them all, bring them into the German nation and, and ethnically cleanse all the Slavs and, and other people who lived there, turn them into servants. Of course, this effort failed spectacularly. And all of those German minorities were seen as the guilty minorities who had collaborated with Hitler and were ethnically cleansed at the end of World War II. And they fled or were killed and, um, and they no longer live there. If you take a little place like Crimea, 
in, down there in the Black Sea, which has been in the news so much recently, 7%, 6% of Crimeans were ethnic Germans before World War II. Hitler conquered Crimea. He turned those Germans into a collaborative elite that helped him rule. As soon as he was driven out, they were all seen as enemies of the state, a sixth column, a fifth column, excuse me. And so they were driven out. Many were taken to Siberia, but others fled. And there are no more ethnic Germans in Crimea, essentially. And that's what went on in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in, the, in this effort to create nation states that have homogeneous ethnic basis for the state. Um, we're not going to worry too much about the development of nation states. I'm not going to bother you with that. Here's a little graph. Nation states are new in Europe, of course. We just heard in your introduction uh, about the creation of this state system. But if we really look at the French Revolution, the American revolutions, as these twin revolutions that are creating nation states with a sense of citizenship instead of empire, that really begins around the time of the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And you see the creation of increasingly uh, more and more nation states to, to the point where we get to 193, I believe it is today. But World War I, you see that big spike in, at World War I, where all these new nation states are created out of, um, out of the Paris Peace Conference. But nation states are really so new because you see most nation states you know, just between 1945, the end of World War II, and 1970, there are 100 new nation states get their independence and join the UN. So nation states are really very new. And much of the violence, I believe, that we're seeing in the world, whether it's in Sudan and, and, and Port Middle East, like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, is because those nation states, the different peoples that got trapped within the borders, of these new nation states are fighting for dominance inside those nation states. Minorities, zero sum game, it's very brutal with a lot of ethnic cleansing. And that's where the right to protect comes in is you're trying to stop this process of the great sorting out, I would argue. Now in the Middle East, we're coming to our area of uh, the Ottoman Empire, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire that's destroyed. You see it on your left here. The pink parts are what's left of the Ottoman Empire by World War I. Um, all the yellow parts are what had been in the Ottoman Empire, but it got picked off by colonial powers or by the emergence of nationalism in places like Greece and Bul Bulgaria and so forth. But the new nation states on your right with Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon being created out of this process after 1919, part of the class of 1919. In the Middle East, in a, particularly in the Levant, what you get is a, is, a, is a new, it's a little bit different than Central Europe because, because of colonial domination in the interwar period where the French and British rule, they help minor, minorities in every one of the Levantine states come to power and they give them the lion's share of power. And in the last 30, 40 years in the Middle East, you've been seeing the majority of the population, ethnic majorities, trying to drive out those minorities, which has been very violent process. And if we look, if we just go scanning through some of the major states in the Middle East, I'm gonna give you a two second huh, version. If we look at Anatolia, which becomes modern, Turkey in the 19, early 1920s, because Ataturk builds an army, he gets rid of the colonial occupation where the Ottoman Empire, Anatolia was divided up between the great powers and the Greeks invade. In his effort to build a Turkish state, modern nation state, he destroys the Christians of Anatolia. 20% of the population of Anatolia was Christian in 1914 before World War I. By the time Turkey gets its independence and defeats the Greeks and Ataturk establishes a, a stable modern Turkey, there are only 1% Christians left in Anatolia. All the rest have been ethnically cleansed. And there's two major groups of Christians as the Armenian Christians, 
in the east of the country, which is this, this sort of more pinkish color you're seeing, coral, they're all driven out, as we know, and accused of being a fifth column who are helping the Russians in World War I, and they are brutally destroyed. And many flee to Syria and neighboring countries. In the west of the country of Anatolia are the Greek Orthodox, who are also driven out in a big population exchange with Greece. I won't, of course, today, if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's the Kurds, ethnic minority that remains in Turkey. About 14 million people are Kurdish in modern Turkey, in modern Turkey, 18% of the population, roughly. We're not quite sure how many, but they are the undigested minority. And there's been constant low-level warfare since the 1980s, 70s, really, um, and over 40,000 people killed in this ongoing ethnic strife in Anatolia. But that's part of the great sorting out. I'm going to just flip to Cyprus for two seconds because it, it really highlights so simply the basic thesis of this discussion, which is if we look at the map of Cyprus, the early map of Cyprus, you see all those little green dots. Those are Muslims. And the Greek Orthodox, the majority of the population, are living in these scattered little villages um, that aren't separated. But you get modern nation state, you get the Turkish invasion in 1974, and all of the Muslims flee and go up to the Turkish north, and all the Christians are driven out of the Turkish north to the, Tur to the Christian south, the Greek south. And today, we know that Cyprus is divided into these two ethnic groups, religious, religio-ethnic groups. And that is, you know, the great sorting out and it's modern nationalism. And we won't spend time on Lebanon, but many of you are familiar with Lebanon and the Christian, the Christians are helped to power by the French and they slowly lose it uh, with a Christian, with a civil war. Let's go to Iraq. Iraq, modern Iraq, the Sunnis held the lion's share of power under the Ottomans, under the British till the 1940s, and then under the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein. America decides it does not like the tyranny of Iraq, and it wants to overthrow Saddam Hussein, who is brutally suppressed. The other elements of the population, which are the 60% Shiites in the south, the green part, and the Kurds in the north, 20, 25% of the country. And America goes in to protect R2P. In theory, this is what America is doing, is to get rid of the evil dictatorship and to build democracy and to bring freedom agenda to the Iraqis. So America comes in to protect the population, but what does it do by kicking over the state, it kindles this great sorting out. And it's going to catapult the Shiites, the majority ethnic population of 60%, to the top of Iraqi society from the bottom. And it's going to, it's going to cast the Sunni elite, 20%, from the top of society down to the bottom. And that sets off this very brutal ethnic civil war which we all know about, and in which the Sunnis really get battered. They, of course, try to come out first as Al-Qaeda and secondly as ISIS in order, to, in order to take back power and to reclaim what they believe is their nation state. And they lose both times. America helps to destroy them as a fighting power and has helped the Shiites to the top. And that has been very brutal, hundreds of thousands of dead, millions of refugees. Um, the minorities, whether it's the Christians and so forth, have been, and the Yazidis, as we've known most recently, are destroyed and flee the country. Almost very few left in Iraq today. Palestine fits into this paradigm. 1850, the Jewish percentage of Palestine was only about 4% Jewish. By 1914, with the beginning of immigration and Zionism, 
it's by 14% roughly by the, by the eve of World War I. By 1948, because of the rise of Hitler and Jews fleeing Europe, it's gone up to 33%. But in the 1948 war, the two groups launch into the war. The Arabs believe that they can win because they're two thirds of the population. They have Arab countries neighboring them. They lose spectacularly. And um, 800,000 Palestinians are driven out of Palestine, become refugees. And the Jews win and are able to make themselves a majority in the country today. And it's not, of course, completely resolved. But I would say it's unlikely that the Palestinians are going to get a hunk of Palestine. They've been fighting a rearguard action ever since. It's been long and uh, bloody. And of course, to be fair to the Jews, they were ethnically cleansed in Europe and then throughout the Middle East. Cities like Baghdad uh, were the Jews were the largest single religious group in Baghdad um, in World War I. There are no more Jews left in Baghdad, no more Jews in Damascus, which had a big population, or Aleppo, or Yemen, and so forth, right across the Middle East. All those Jews have been driven out and have gone to Israel or to the West. So this great sorting out process, long and bloody, the borders are not changed to fit the people. The people are changed to fit the borders. That brings us to Syria. In Syria, the Alawites are the minority of interest for us. The French recruited them overwhelmingly into the military that it built when it occupied Syria in 1920. Uh, it recruited Christians and other minorities into the, into the, the army that it built during the interwar years. Uh, Muslims were loath, Sunni Muslims were loath to uh, volunteer, but many did from the countryside, but not from the, so much from the cities. But by the time the French left in 46, the military had a law, a big uh, over-recruited Alawite contingent. Those Alawites through over a series of coups rise to the top. And that's how Hafs al-Assad, the father of Bashar al-Assad gets to power in 1970 through a military coup. And he puts his family and the Alawite community firmly in control and the, fills up the upper ranks of the military and the security forces with Alawites. Today, the top 40 officers in the army are all Alawite. Um, and that's how he's held control of Syria. And that's why the civil war was so brutal because he believed that if the Sunni Arabs, which form about 65% of the Syrian population, were able to, to throw them out, that the Alawites could be ethnically cleansed as the Armenians were in Turkey and so forth. Um, and it, or that they might meet the same fate as the Sunnis of Iraq. So he dug in his heels and he fought like mad and he used chemical weapons and every other horrid thing that he did. And the civil war was extremely brutal. And the Sunni Arabs who formed most of the rebel militias failed uh, to overthrow the government of Syria and defeat the Syrian army. Obviously Russia and Iran jumped in to help them and the United States and Saudi Arabia, the Gulf countries got squeamish about here helping the Syrian opposition because they it radicalized and groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS became powerful and it 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 it, um, it turned away from the Arab opposition and joined you know began to help the Kurds destroy ISIS who are Sunni Muslims Sunni Arabs and a part of this uprising against Assad. Let me just show you this map, which is what ISIS conquered during at the height, 2015, of its effort to build a state. And in many ways, I think the way we have to look at ISIS, in a sense, as, as a effort by Sunni Arabs to overthrow Shiite-dominated states 
the Shiite state in Baghdad, and the Alawite, which is a Shiite offshoot state in Damascus. The Sunnis felt beleaguered, put upon, aggrieved, and oppressed. And ISIS was going to champion them, and in a sense sought to create a Sunni, very sectarian Sunni state in both Iraq and Syria. And that's you know, the Islamic state of Iraq and Syria. And wipe out the minorities and drive them out, ethnically cleanse them from these areas. And all that black area that was conquered by ISIS are Sunni dominated areas. And the Kurds were being driven out of Northern Syria. The Yazidis of course were enslaved and killed and uh, Alawites were driven out. The Christians were largely driven out of that entire area. So it was an effort, I think, to build an Islamo Sunni Arab state, ethno state in this area because the various peoples that had been pushed together had failed to find a, a happy national identity and uh, convivienda. Um, today, Syria looks like this. The Kurds, with American help, dominate the Northeast in that orange part. The Syrian government, security state dominated by Alawites, but with a lot of Sunni help uh, in the purple parts. And uh, Turkey is in the north, in Idlib province in North Aleppo with Sunni Arab rebels ruling there. And so Syria is divided into these three major zones. I won't belabor this, but there's been a fair amount of ethnic cleansing. Uh, it hasn't been completely carried, you know, it hasn't, it, it, Syria remains a very divided country along these sectarian ethnic lines. Let me just conclude by jumping to Yemen. I think Yemen fits into this broad survey of new states, the class of 1919, created out of the Paris Peace Conference, in which, um, of course, Yemen is older. The British had occupied it earlier on in Aden, but the Yazidis, the, excuse me, <laughs> um, the Houthis are, are in these, the Houthis who are Zaidi Muslims live in this green area here. That's where they're the majority. And they are Shia. They're Shia offshoot, but they're Shia <clears throat> Muslims. The rest, of Yemenis in this yellowish area are Sunni. And the uh, battle lines have been drawn along these sectarian lines, largely not like we saw in Iraq and Syria. And it's become, and Iran has sided with the Shiites and Saudi Arabia and the UAE have sided with the Sunnis in this long and brutal civil war. And of course, the United States has sided with the Sunnis because Saudi Arabia is their ally and they're keeping their ally happy. Uh, and Iran has helped the Shia. And that's, you know, here today, the Shia, the Houthis have conquered out beyond the confines of their majoritarian area, but they've stopped um, not too far out from that area. And it's, you know, that we've got this sort of standstill now with the Houthi rebels in the, in the red parts and uh, pro-government in the green. And there's also a third um, Southern Transitional Council, which has is, which is decided it wants its own state around Aden. Now, let me just, you know, I've got this little graph of what's happened to minorities as a zero sum game for minorities in this great sorting out. And in Egypt, the cops, of which were about 17% after World War II, have fallen below, well below 10%. Uh, and that's true right across the board. In Syria, after World War II, Christians were about 15%. Today, they're maybe 3% of the Syrian population. In Iraq, they've almost been completely wiped out. Uh, in Palestine, they've gone from 10% down to 2% or something less than 2%. The only states which have gained Christians are Saudi Arabia and Gulf states because they had none. 
And um, and of course, they're not citizens. They're they're usually just visa guest workers and so forth. So that that's really it shouldn't even be in there, but it's on the graph. But that's what's happening to minorities, and it's not just Christians. I mean, I've highlighted Christians because I'm talking to a, a church group. But Ismailis, Baha'is, Yazidis, Druze, Armenians, Shabak, Mandians, Marsh Arabs, it's been devastating for all of them in this great sorting out, this, this attempt to build a common national community. Uh, minorities have really been beaten up. And that really brings me to the end of my formal talk. And let me just conclude by saying, you know, what lessons are learned from this? What does this mean for R2P? We have very brittle states in the Middle East, but if you kick them over and try to replace them, they aren't easily replaced. It's very hard to build a new state because you have these battling different peoples who are very worried about their safety. The default is fragmentation and civil war, not democracy. So you wanna be very careful not to try to do this regime change that we tried out in Iraq um, and in Syria and Libya which was clothed in R2P and led by efforts, at least that was the rhetorical argument that was used with the public, the American public and the Western public for these interventions. Now we can argue that there were other reasons and that this is, but many of us got behind this these efforts for the R2P aspect, the humanitarian aspect of going to fix things and make people secure, safe, and greater human rights. And it turned out that it created a lot of ethnic cleansing and long and brutal civil wars. Um, so we have to be careful about this attempt to, to eliminate evil dictators uh, because you often get something even worse. Uh, foreign involvement, we know from many big studies of civil war, the more foreign involvement, the longer the civil wars last and the more people get killed. So humility um, is probably an appropriate approach to countries which have lots of different ethnic and religious groups in them, you know, do no harm. Um, Education is important and particularly religious education so that people get to know each other within their own nation states and don't see each other as fifth columns and, and foreigners. But um, that's why I'm a, a skeptic of the right to protect because I think that our interventions in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, were led in large part by this effort to protect. And what I tried to describe to you is this very, this violent process of state building, nation building that is taking place in these new nation states. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of it in Africa. We are seeing a lot more of it in Africa because you have tons of various tribal and linguistic groups, ethnic groups also, enclosed in these new national borders and they haven't found a way, they have yet to find a happy national community. And that, that leads to, often can lead to war and, um, and very difficult, long and bloody as we see with these refugee outflows and how to deal with that. I mean, that's what we're struggling with here is how to, how to not to, exacerbate that kind of the kind of ethnic cleansing that we know can take place, particularly when foreign powers step in as Hitler did in Central Europe, as um, you know, as we're seeing in Ukraine with Russia stepping in and playing on the aggrieved Russian speakers in the in the east in the eastern parts of the country. So 
Um, and America can play that role and has played that role in the Middle East to a certain extent and, and, and created, I think, often not helped on the humanitarian um, in, in trying to bring greater peace to the region. And so that's where I, you know, I know this is not positive. I, I was asked to try to highlight areas where the international community had stepped in and made things better. But I, I decided to, to go with the, the opposite, to, to, to try to spell out this cautionary tale of what I think is happening and where a lot of the violence is coming from and how we're often misled into thinking that we can create democracy and that democracy is a solution for this by destroying these dictatorial states that are holding together these different ethnic groups, often with um, you know, unpleasant means. So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing and come back to you um, and I'm gonna end my lecture. And I say, thank you very much. Well, on behalf of the uh, group, I want to thank you for that. I think some in the group uh, wanted to do this theme so we could understand why it was so difficult to make progress under the notion of responsibility to protect. And you have certainly um, given us much to think about that. I, I would like to push you a little bit on one point. Um, one could say yes, um, throughout history, there's been a lot of violence and the nation state has appeared and disappeared. You know very well that Poland for a while appeared on the map and then uh, Poland disappeared. Um, one of the supposed new rules of world affairs is that you just don't invade other countries and you don't change things by force. You don't commit aggression. And when Russia does it in Ukraine, there's a big reaction to that. Right. So what's wrong with trying to break the pattern of history and say, in the modern era, you don't change borders by force and you don't do ethnic cleansing. Yes, there's been a lot of that in history, but what's wrong with trying to impose some different rules of the game? Well, I think you're, you're right uh, that the modern nation, you know, the modern state rules have been state sovereignty. And of course, R2P was, was created to, to try to stop the sort of internal uh, violence that was taking place in places like Yugoslavia or Syria um, when brutal dictators oppress their own people. The, the problem with that is it allows countries like, let's take the United States in a situation like Syria, where you have a public uprising, the Syrian government suppresses it violently. The Alawite minority that's ruling Syria feels threatened and it uses brutal force. The United States, in order to protect this public, violates the national sovereignty rule that had guided international law since World War I and says, no, we're going to protect Syrians by funneling in arms, building an insurgency, and overthrowing Assad. But of course, we miscalculated on several fronts. We thought that by giving arms to the Syrian opposition, we were going to get a democratic outcome. And in fact, the arms tended to percolate out towards Al-Qaeda and ISIS, which were the strongest 
elements in the Syrian opposition. And secondly, Russia and Iran jumped in to counter American moves. And so you get more and more arms being shuffled in and you get a much higher degree of violence. And so it backfires on them. The same thing happened in Iraq to a large degree. And, and it's happened in Yemen as well because the breakdown of the Yemeni state has just led to all these foreign actors jumping in. And we see that in Libya today where you have mercenaries from Turkey has sent in mercenaries and Russia has sent in mercenaries and the French and the Italians are all worried about the oil and everybody is mucking around. Um, and the country is very divided. So it seems to me that we misinterpreted as a public we got behind some of these efforts because we thought we were going to protect. And that was, you know, in Libya was the very clear agenda of, of the UN resolution was to protect the people from this nasty, brutal Qaddafi. But it, it's turned out to have led to this long and bloody civil war. So I, I know I'm totally sympathetic with an effort to, to um, come up with some kind of to move away from the single focus on national sovereignty, because then you end up supporting dictators. And that's what we did in the Middle East for a long time. We supported people like Saddam Hussein and we went along with the Assads and the Mubaraks and the, the various, but breaking those states has just opened us up to a lot of, um, you know, a Pandora's box and I'm worried that in Ukraine, I understand the, 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 you know, on the Ukraine, we're on the side of the angels in a sense, because Russia's invading a sovereign country. So we're at least in this one, we're not helping an insurgency against a sovereign country. So there is no contradiction with international law. Um, but by funneling on all these arms, the Ukrainians are likely to be very badly hurt. Um, they, they want them, at least the, the, the state has demanded them, but it's going to be long and bloody. Uh, I, I can't imagine a way out of that now that, that Putin has just put his heels in his big army. And I, I don't know who, you know, it's certainly the best way to protect sovereignty and to protect the national integrity of Ukraine. Is it going to help protect the people? Or are we going to see very high casualty rates because all these external powers are going to jump in and funnel in arms? Um, that, you know, those are two very different things. Protecting the state and protecting the people. I don't, that doesn't really answer you, <laughs> but um, it's a cautionary, I don't know. I don't know how you think about better ways to, to do this. I mean, we've just gone through this very difficult time of entering into from Iraq, you know, 2003 to today. I think all Americans are scratching their head on the same issue. How, how could we have done it better and help promote democracy in the Middle East without these long and difficult wars? Well, while I uh, pursue another question, I'll remind all the participants to write your questions in the chat box. Uh, if my chat box is working right, I am not seeing uh, new questions being posed, which is fine with me because that allows me to pose another question. There are states that are made up of different groups, language groups, religious groups. They do hang together. And at least recently, there hasn't been ethnic cleansing. Uh, uh, Belgium is an example with the Dutch speakers and the French speakers. Uh, actually, the UK with the English, the Scots, the Welsh, they have managed. Actually, 
Switzerland with the uh, Catholics and the Protestants, the French speakers, the German speakers, the Italian speakers. Admittedly, uh, that's all in Europe. But there are examples where there is power sharing among different religious groups or linguistic groups. It doesn't always have to be ethnic cleansing with one group dominating by force. You left out all those possibilities about power sharing. I did. And, you know, obviously it's a very big topic because we've got a, we've got 193 nation states and each one is a little bit different. But let me, just for the, the sake of, of, um, of um, simplicity, let me just, in, I think in Western Europe, you get where you have the rise of these, you know, enlightened absolutism, if you will, and territorial states in places like France, Britain, Spain, the state is established first, and then the nation comes second. So in many ways, a centralized state, a Louis XIV in France, who says, l'état c'est moi, I am the state, and begins to homogenize people so that the Huguenots, so that the, the Britannia and the Languedoc and the various language speakers, because until 1870, I believe it is, there's a great book by Weber, Eugene Weber at UCLA, who wrote, uh, I think it's, um, it's called Peasants to Frenchmen. And he, he says it's not until 1870 that more than 50% of French people spoke a French that Parisians could understand. And that, you know, French were homogenized through um, the centralized rule and through then dictation and the little state system that made everybody write in the same way with this, all those French schools. And you develop a nation through this powerful state that creates a nation. In Eastern Europe, the nation is really posited, is created first, and then you get the state. Because there's the Holy Roman Empire and all these big ethnic empires, you don't have nation states. So in a place like Germany or Italy, you come up with the idea of the nation first. And then you have to create a state to fit the nation. And that's where you get a Germany or an Italy in a Risorgimento, which is based on an ethnic nationalism rather than a territorial legalistic nationalism. And, and that's much more difficult because there's the minorities don't fit into this ethnic, we're Italians or we're Germans. Then if you're a Jew, you're an outlier and there's no place for you in the nation state. Um, and that's what you get in the Slavic, you know, these late forming states, it's the nation that's created first and it looks to make a state. Minorities are cut out. Whereas in where the states are created first, and then you get a nation, it's a territorial based, it's a legalistic nation, and it's perhaps less violent when it comes to suppressing the minorities because you have a longer period of time in which minorities can be turned into the majority through education and through territorialism. And that's why in America, to be a citizen, you're either born here, you get naturalized, um, but if you're born in the state, then you belong to the nation. Whereas in a place like Germany, if you're a Turk being born there until very recently, you were not part of the nation. And if you were a German that lived in the Soviet Union for five generations, you could still come home and become a German. And two million Germans left the Soviet Union in 1990 and got German citizenship, even though they some of them had gone to become farmers under the czars in the 1840s. You know, Igor Schmidt from, from Kazakhstan could still go back and become a German again because he was ethnically German. And that's a very different type of nationalism in the East, in the late forming states, as opposed to the West. So that's a, 
a little effort to try to, I guess, um, explain some of those differences and how it's, it, it was easier in the West where you've got the state first, nation second. One of our participants wants to pursue the subject of Iraq a little more and ask whether you think there could be a kind of power sharing within one Iraq, Shia, Sunni, Kurds, whatever, or whether a better solution might be three new states rather right. than one multinational Iraq. Well, I think Iraq was a perfect case where you know people did, and Biden was one of those people who wrote early on saying it should be broken into three parts. But it was too big for America to say, because it's illegal to do that. As an occupying power, you're not allowed to carve a country up into three states along ethnic lines. And so he kept Iraq. I mean, the United States kept Iraq as an integral state and, and harped on this idea of, national, of sovereignty and the UN and obeying law. Now, in Yugoslavia, it's sort of the exception that proves the rule that it's not the borders that are changed, but the people are changed to fit the borders. And in Yugoslavia, we did change the borders. And out of one state, we created seven for all the different peoples. And in some ways that has worked out. It certainly worked out for the, you know, the, the Slovenes and Croatians and so forth. For others, it hasn't worked so well, um, but it, it did, it did stop this process of ethnic cleansing that was going on in Yugoslavia. And as particularly if you have great powers that are willing to police it and a UN that's willing to police it. Of course, in, so Iran could have, it, it could have been split into three. Of course, it's a very messy process because a city like Baghdad, which was 6 million people, was all mixed. And who's gonna get Baghdad? How do you, how do you solve those problems like Kirkuk which is a multi-ethnic city or Baghdad, multi-ethnic. What happened is that there was a lot of ethnic cleansing in Baghdad. And you look at the neighborhoods today compared to what they were before, they've really been separated along religious and ethnic lines uh, in a way that they, they weren't under Saddam Hussein. But you know, in some ways it, it might've been less violent if America were willing to police something like that. But then you have to compensate people for land and let them come, let them sell their land and buy new land. You have to adjudicate all of those delicate little transfers. And that's where the Czechs and the Slovaks, who, even though they're very developed, couldn't live together. And they separated what we call the Velvet Revolution, right, where they were given a year to choose whether they wanted to live as a minority if they were living in the wrong side of the Czechs and Slovak split, whether they wanted to stay as a minority in their house or whether they wanted to live, they were given a year to choose whether they wanted to go to the other side. And, and that was the, you know, sort of the soft, happy split along ethnic lines. But it would have taken America, you know, we thought we were going to be in and out of there in six months, and that we'd leave it to some democratic government that would figure all this out. And of course, in order to chop it into three, we would have had to go in with hundreds of thousands of people. We would have had to take everybody's name, figured out where they wanted to live, how to compensate them for being moved and make sure that nobody got killed. None of which we were willing to do. So it's a great idea, but it's, it was way beyond America's power. Uh, we got everything wrong about Iraq. Our assumptions were all wrong. And, um, and so, you know, probably it would have been better, but would have meant sending hundreds of thousands of troops there and, and doing everything, getting into the weeds, which America didn't have the speakers or anything, you know, if we, anyway, that's the way I think about it. We've got a couple of questions that are going to, keep you in Europe. I know your specialty is the Middle East and Syria and all of that. So uh, maybe we'll work our way back to that. And of course, Iraq was uh, in right. your region of the world. Uh, 
One of our questioners wants to know, since you're, you're pretty pessimistic or realistic about some of the new objectives and new language in R2P and particularly stopping ethnic cleansing, which you've, you've explained very well in history, does all of this mean that we shouldn't care about Ukraine and invasion from outside? This is more about outside aggression, although it's linked to internal yes. Russian ethnic speakers and Putin's claim that there's genocide against the ethnic Russians and so forth. So does your realism, does your reading of history say it's pretty hopeless to care about Ukraine being invaded from outside and Russia trying to take over what it sees is at the heart, heart of the old Russian empire? Should we just not care about that? Because uh, history is um, unjust, history is unfair, and that's just the way it is? Well, it depends on what your objective is, obviously. If your objective is to contain Russia, and to stand up for sovereignty of nation states, then we're doing, you know, then Europe is doing the right thing by, by sending in bombers and, you know, shoveling in as many anti-tank missiles as we can do and anti-aircraft missiles. And we can, we can, we can certainly give the Russia, we can bleed Russia, I think very badly in Ukraine. And it, it does seem that a Ukrainian national identity is, is, is being formed in front of our eyes. I mean, Ukrainians are finding a real national identity in this crisis, uh, which is part of this process we're talking about. Now, but it's gonna kill a lot of Ukrainians. And maybe that's, you know, Maybe that's the price you have to pay to become a nation state. I don't know. But if your objective is not to kill people, you'd probably let Russia win and say, okay, uh, we don't want to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian, which is the attitude that we're taking now, which is it's worth it. And we can stick it to Russia. And, and maybe Russia has got bigger ambitions to go into the Baltic states. We don't know really what Putin's ambitions are. So maybe killing a bunch of Ukrainians, in a sense, will protect all these other people that we don't even know could be dying in the future. And they won't die if we make a stand in Ukraine. I don't, you know, those, <laughs> I can't answer those questions. But those are the big questions that, that are obviously weighing on everybody's mind is what is enough power, what's the right amount of power to stop somebody like Putin from just treating all these smaller peoples like a doormat? And, uh, you know, I, I've wrestled with this moral problem in Syria constantly, and I've, I've made a lot of enemies in the process because my attitude was from the beginning that this was that Assad was going to be much harder to overturn because I, I, I understood the ethnic dimension of this struggle. He wasn't going to leave and he wasn't because he was frightened of, of his, his people were frightened of being ethnically cleansed and they were going to fight tooth and nail and they did. Then the question is, do, do you want to overthrow him? I mean, he is a minority that set up this regime that's going to be very violent because it's a minority trying to hold power. Um, the trouble is we fought for 10 years there. We shoveled in tens of billions of dollars of arms, whether it's the Saudis or Qataris or Turks or United States or all the other countries that participated in this. We don't know the amount of funding that went into the arms because it's all covert, but it, it's tens of billions of dollars. And it led to a much higher death rate and much greater destruction. If Assad had won, if nobody had jumped in and funded the opposition, he would have suppressed this uprising much faster. 
you would have had the same outcome with Assad ruling. And a lot less people dead. But of course, you wouldn't have stood up for freedom, democracy in the American way. If in fact, that's what was going on here. And so I don't know, you know, there's no easy answer to this. And each case becomes so different. It's so hard to draw analogies because every country is so different. And uh, I, I'm very, you know, I watch the nationalism that's been built up and particularly I've, I've been astounded by European response to the Ukraine because they're finding, they're all finding a voice and to see Germany really increase its budget, military budget um, and send in these arms and make these promises, it's, it's, it's very surprising. And I, I understand it. It's clearly a very, a, you know, a big moment. And I don't really understand it. I don't understand the dimensions and it's hard to know what the death rate is gonna be out of this. Um, so I really don't have any, I don't have a clear way of thinking my way through it. I'm, I, I wish I could give up, a, 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 uh, because there's so many dimensions of just broad, of, of, of power to this, of that notion that America, that NATO needs to confine Russia and push it into a corner because Russia is a brutal power. And it is a brutal, you know, we were seeing how brutal it can be in Ukraine, but where is culpability in this? I'm not, um, you know, how, how could it have been dealt with perhaps to avoid this kind of an outcome? I don't know whether not pushing so hard would have avoided this or whether it just would have been a invitation to Putin to get away with ever more and more. I don't know the answer to that. A couple of good questions have come up. Interesting questions about the Middle East or Africa. Uh, if, if R2P isn't the way to go, if it's too aspirational, too idealistic, then what are we supposed to do when we see genocides like Rwanda? Just look the other way? Um, boy, you know, we did look the other way in Congo. We're looking the other way in Sudan. We're looking the other way today in Ethiopia with, you know, I was just reading yesterday about <clears throat> Tigrayans being massacred in a, a number of villages where people are just being shot uh, in order to ethnically cleanse them in the same sort of nation building process. And we do look at the other way a lot. Um, uh, obviously, oh boy. You have to pick your battles clearly. And you have to be willing to go all the way. Because if you're not willing to go very far in stopping this, um, you can make matters worse, I think, as, in a, as we see in a country like Syria, where we got spooked and we decided, ah, it's not worth it after a certain point of time. And I think you really have to pick your battles and figure out where you've got enough support to make an intervention stick and to go for the long term because often fixing these kinds of things takes decades. And we just saw in Afghanistan that we were good for two decades, but we weren't good for the third decade. And so we pulled it out. And now, you know, our university is in the process of taking 10. The Afghan refugee scholars and trying to we've raised money, but you know, it's the dribs and draps. But all those Afghans, my, my sister-in-law is in Mashhad, Iran, for working for the UNHCR. She's the head of the office in Iran that's up there by the Afghan border. And she's dealing with, she says there are thousands of Afghans coming across the border every day. Most of them can't get through because the Iranians are sick and tired of hosting more and more Afghans. They've done it for decades now. And, uh, and so it's very difficult to get in the country, but they've got an onslaught. And they said the situation is getting worse and worse in Afghanistan. There can be, you know, this can be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of more Afghan refugees coming out of the country. And 
you know, we pulled a plug because we didn't have the, we weren't willing to sustain our vision of what we wanted. We, we were failing, we failed. We failed in Syria. We're helping the Kurds, of which there are 2 million in Syria today, but we're gonna fail the Kurds because the Kurds want their own independent country. We've helped them build a military in Northern Syria. We own 25% of Northern Syria, of Syria where our troops are helping the Kurds with their military in a quasi-independent state. But we won't do that for very long and we'll leave. And then the Kurds have no air force and they'll be immediately destroyed as a military force once we leave. And Syria will take it back because we believe in international borders and nobody will stop them. Maybe the Turks will enter in and kill Kurds from the North, but those Kurds are gonna get whacked, if I can use that word, um, the moment we pull out. And we're gonna pull out, because how long can America sustain staying in Northern Syria, even if it's only a few thousand troops? That's the question. And it's a question for your audience. Is, you know, we're doing R2P in Northern Syria with the Kurds. But we can't build a nation out of the Kurds in the North because there's only 2 million, they're very poor and American people don't wanna do it. They wanna build their own public schools. And as soon as a bunch of Americans get killed up there, we're gonna withdraw. Maybe not under Biden because he's already withdrawn from Afghanistan and he promised he would stay. But the next administration or the one after that is gonna pull out of Syria, Northern Syria. And then we're gonna leave them. So when we enter in, to these countries, we've got to be, we've got to understand that building a new nation state that protects its people is a difficult thing to do. And um, that's the, that's the, that's the heavy lift. You segued right into the other question that was pending and you answered that it was about the Kurds and the future of Kurdistan and you, um, you covered that. Maybe, maybe we should end with a question that gets us back to Europe. We, we see in Europe two things going on at the same time. You have the building of the European Union, despite the withdrawal of the British. So, and you see a lot of European unity on the question of Ukraine. At the same time, there's a Scottish independence movement, there's a Catalonian independence movement. Are we sort of condemned to this turbulence of formation of nation states, uh, devolution of central authority, formation of micro states? Are, are we sort of just condemned to this uh, turbulence about national identity, ethnicity, changing uh, borders? Is that just the way the world has been? In your view as a historian, we, that's just the way things are gonna be? Um, let me say yes and no. I, I, wanna, I wanna end on a positive note. And I think that the, the positive note to end on is that there's a lot less violence today than there used to be per capita. More and more people are living in stability with a fairly good standard of living where they don't confront. I mean, you look at all of us living in a very stable United States, we don't confront violence on a personal scale. Almost none of us do. Of course, there are, there are neighborhoods that are violent in the United States, but you know, most middle-class Americans are living very safe, protected, sheltered lives. And that's more and more people in the world, whether it's in China or India, in, stable, in nation states that have developed fairly responsive central governments, that's true. And it, we, we've, we can follow the amount of violence in the world and the amount of the number, the percentage of people that have to engage in some kind of violence. And it's falling. It's falling quite dramatically with the development of strong central states that have a monopoly over violence where there's police forces that work effectively. Getting there is difficult. And 
as you point out, building a common market, an EU, these super state structures, particularly in the metropolitan, in the areas that first got nation states like Western Europe, those supranational organizations are working well. And they're binding people together because they feel like they have a common community, whether it's the French and the Germans and the Dutch and so forth, who, who do feel like they share a common community, which is part of the reason why the Ukrainians have, have elicited this amazing response, because Europeans see them as, as Europeans. And how do we get the international community to feel more like that? In part, I think it will happen only after nation states develop more fully in places like Africa and the Middle East. You know, today, the first world is busy building all these walls. Because this nation building process has really gotten underway in a very violent way in places like the Middle East and Africa. And we're gonna see a lot more in Africa with, with, with tons of refugees pouring out. And we've, we've seen it growing and countries like Italy now are building very strong coast guards the way America did in 1970s, beginning with Carter, but then in Reagan, when the Haitians and the Cubans all started coming, the boat people started coming to America and we built a big coast guard with radar. And now we don't let them put their toes on Florida. We capture them at sea and we return them to Haiti or wherever they're gonna go back to. And we built the wall. And Europe is building a wall through the Mediterranean to keep the Africans out and to keep the Middle Easterners out. How do we, at the same time, is there, they've got Schengen. They're allowing Europeans to come from one end to the other. And these Ukrainians, they've opened the door to Ukrainians and they're gonna flood. I mean, the refugee, we've just saw seen a few hundred thousand come out of Ukraine, but if this war gets as bloody as I think it's going to get, we're going to see millions coming out. And Europe's going to choke on refugees, which means that Afghans that are trying to get out, the Syrians, the Iraqis, and others are going to be really cut out, because I think that the wall is going to go up as they try to deal with this internal turbulence. But the promise, of course, is that national identity changes very quickly. And if we look at what Germany did, you know, here in World War II, Germany was killing its Semites and exterminated Semites in Europe. Merkel, German identity in 50 short years changed enough that Merkel is known in the Arab world in Syria as Mama Merkel because she opened the doors and allowed a million Syrians into Germany who are Semites, if you will. And the Germans have done a pretty damn good job. Of course, it created a backlash and all this. But the Germans have done a, an amazing job of absorbing and helping those Syrians. And that's just in a 60 year period, which is very promising about what happens once you've built a common community in a nation state that, that's, that's running well, that you can absorb new immigrants. You can be welcoming. Of course, when it happens too quickly, too fast, people, there's a backlash. But national identities can outgrow that chauvinistic phase of that's, that's very destructive and become welcoming. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where we hope the international, more and more countries will, will get to that point so that there are less and less places in the world that are really riven with this kind of violence um, and ethnic cleansing. I guess that's the hope. So I see many good things, a real decline in violence writ large, um, welcoming communities in part, who've accepted a lot of immigrants. And Europe is accepting much more immigrants than it used to. It's much more tolerant than it used to be. And hopefully that, that will spread. But of course, when there's too much and there's too much violence in a country like Sudan or something, and you, you've got a lot of immigrants, there is a big backlash to it. And, and, uh, and Africa is just beginning down that road of real 
I think, nation building process. And it's going to be very difficult, um, period. But more and more of the world is getting stable, centralized governments that are highly high functioning and where people live really violence free, violent free lives. And that's the good, that's the good, you know, that's the thing you want to encourage. And America has encouraged that in many parts of the world through development and through good government and through you know, providing a, a, an international system that's based on law. So on behalf of the uh, local organizing committee, as well as the 50 or so people who uh, tuned in tonight to listen and uh, participate in the discussion, I wanna thank you. you bring a uh, rich historical perspective. You remind us of lots of things going on out there. For me, the takeaway consistent with your closing point is that there, there are people struggling to make things better, but it's hard and it's difficult. And there are forces at work that uh, are very difficult to be overcome. And one needs to be realistic about what one is facing in uh, trying to stop some of these atrocities, trying to, we haven't really talked about stopping aggression. It's really been focused on sort of atrocities within states, but it's really hard. It's really a long-term project. It's really difficult. And we really do appreciate the perspectives that you've uh, shared with us this evening. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and I thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's been a great discussion. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thanks so much. Okay. Good night. Thanks to everybody who's with us, and have a good evening to everyone.